I appreciate you um, taking the time out for the interview. Oh, man, no problem. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do it for you. All right, cool. So, you know, first off, you know, I noticed your name was in the credits on the uh, Tony Braxton debut album, you know. How did you get that opportunity, and, you know, what kind of role did you play on that album? Um, when I first moved to Georgia, I um, was, um, I hooked up with a company in Georgia, in, in Atlanta, Georgia, called LaFace Records. And LaFace Records was, of course, uh, the label of L.A. Reed and Babyface at the time. Yep. And uh, L.A. Reed gave me my start in this business, so... You know, by me being associated with L.A. Reid and his label, they had Usher, Tony Braxton, TLC, blah, blah, blah. So that uh, afforded me to be able to work on the um, Tony Braxton album. And um, that's how I worked on that project at that particular time. Okay. Um, you know, you mentioned that L.A. Reid and Babyface, you know, really helped you in the beginnings of your career as a producer. You know, what is one thing that you learned from being around them? One of the things I learned, and it's more so... I would say L.A. Reed, but Babyface is well, more so in L.A., though. But I learned how to make real records. I learned how to produce great songs um, by being around them. Um, I learned how to create artists. I learned how to turn turn an uh, artist into a uh, great performer and things of that nature. Um, those are some of the attributes that I picked up from being around super producers like that at that particular time. Okay, cool. Now, you know, a couple years later, I believe you started Noontime. Um, the management, you know, kind of talk to me about Noontime. Noontime was a company that, that consisted of producers that, were, that, uh, that, that consisted of myself, uh, Brian Michael Cox, and Lafay. And I came into the fold after leaving Lafay. I was kind of a bit of a silent partner because at the time... They were a brand new company, and they didn't really understand the ins and outs of knowing how to create an artist. So, other than just being a producer at noon time, I was also, like I said, kind of a bit of a silent partner while I was kind of helping them, you know, pick acts, pick songwriters, bring different producers and songwriters to the table. So, you know, outside of being a producer, I kind of was instrumental of the business part of it as well. Um and that's kind of how that relationship started. Uh, Chris Hicks, who was, who was, well, he's not anymore, but he's like the uh, former senior vice president of Dev Jam, who went on to be the, who went on to be the uh, uh, vice president of Dev Jam. He was my manager at the time, and he was also was one of the owners of uh, New Time. Okay. So that whole relationship kind of, you know, because I, because before that I had came from LaFace, I had already been tuned up by LaFace. So I kind of knew the ins and outs about the music business as far as how to create songs. Well, one of the questions you asked me going back is you know, how did I learn how to create great music? I learned from L.A. and Faith, but I took my expertise of that over to noontime. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. Now, you know, you mentioned that B. Cox was a part of noontime as well as Jazzy Faye. I believe uh, John T. Austin was also involved. Yes, John T. I brought John T. in as a songwriter. Yeah, did it kind of did it surprise you at all that you know all of them eventually had commercial success afterwards? Yes and no, because the synergy of what we had. First of all, I knew John Say when he was thirteen years old, so we had been friends already. He was already an established songwriter. Um, one of his first big records at the age of thirteen was a song about called "Sweet Lady" by Tyrese. Yep. So I already, I already knew that John Say was a good songwriter. So you know when everybody kind of just start blowing up in their own way. It, it, it wasn't a surprise, but it was a surprise because I understood the synergy. I knew that there were great people around making good music because, once again, I had come already come from an entity of already making great music, i.e. Tony Braxton, Usher, Outkast, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, you know, I have a couple of songs that, you know, you did throughout the years, and if you could, just give me the background on them or anything you remember about the studio session. Absolutely. Okay, cool. The first one is um, Aaliyah's Miss You. Oh, okay. Let me see. That was an interesting session because that song was originally wrote for Genuine. Okay. And uh, Aaliyah, you know, we were, we were in the studio and uh, we were playing her records. She wanted to hear some of the records that John Faye and I had wrote at the time. And, um, and um, we played her a couple of tracks and that particular track happened to kind of pass by and, and and she said, wait a minute, back that up. I want to hear that again. So we played it for her. She said, 
I want to cut that record. So we were kind of like, well, this is Genuine's record. She said, I don't care. I want to cut it. <laughs> so she got on the she got on the phone with Genuine, called Genuine, and said, hey, um, I know you cut this record already, but I would love to cut it. So Genuine, because he was a part writer on the song, it benefited him anyway. So he was kind of like, well, I don't mind. So they were they came from the same camp of you know artists. They come from the same camp anyway. So Genuine said, hey, cut it. So we cut the song on the lead and it went on to be a, you know, a number one hit. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, actually, just a quick question um, regarding that Aaliyah Miss You song. I was just wondering, uh-huh. how, how come it took so long for that song to come out? Oh, man, you really want to hear the story of that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, got time. So, when I first went in to produce that song, the labels didn't really think it was a hit record. Okay. They, didn't. they didn't. They didn't think it was a smash record. They was going all the way. They, they bypassed that record a lot. And... Unfortunately, when she passed, you know, it was almost like they did, that passing forced them to put that particular record up because it was talking, it was symbolically saying "I miss you" and things of that nature. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, but she actually loved the record when we cut it. She loved it. She actually wanted to put it out herself. Okay. As, you know, herself as well. But um, it took it took it took two years for that record to come out after I cut it. Yeah. And um, and sometimes it happens like that. Sometimes you can work on a record in this industry, and it might not come out for another three or four years, and it blows up. But the public would think that you actually done that record at that particular time. You know what I mean? Yeah. But but uh, yeah, it's just an interesting story because that I don't think that the labels at the time really believed in that record, but they went on and took a chance with it, and um, you know it blew blew up it did it was, it was uh, number one for a long time on the charts yeah definitely man and I think that yeah. just goes to show you that you know a timeless record no matter how long you know it's created when it comes out it's still gonna you know hit, hit the top of the charts absolutely absolutely and it tell, and it lets you know that you know if you know people can't dictate what's gonna be a hit or not a hit you really don't know you gotta let the people decide that yeah you gotta let people decide that, because you don't know what people will like, you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Another song I want to ask you about is Tony Braxton's Just Be a Man About It. Okay. Yeah, talk to me about uh, that one. How it came about is, I flew out to L.A., and first of all, mind you, that I had already worked with Tony Braxton. Yep. On her first album, so she requested me again some years later. And um, she asked me, and that, that I was able to bring Brian Cox in on the project and things of that nature. So she asked me to um, work with her, so I brought in John Thay as a songwriter. So we flew out to L.A., but we actually sat around and just talked about what she wanted to talk about because of a comeback. So we talked about what she wanted to talk about, and we came up with a story about, you know, just a man being real about, you know, confessing himself about some of the things that he's done. So we came up with the record and put it together. She liked it, recorded it. And then, um, I, uh, ironically, Dr. Dre was in the studio next door. Yeah. And I went next door to ask him would he participate in the song. Now, just to give you a little bit of song, Martin Lawrence or Will Smith was actually supposed to do his talking part. Okay. But... But they, those two schedules were so busy at the time, so Dr. Dre happened to be right next door. I went next door, asked him to do it, and he agreed, so he ended up being the speaking voice on the actual song. Wow. <laughs> yep. That's cool. <laughs> and, but when, when you look at it visually, people, a lot of people thought that Dr. Dre produced that record. Yeah. But it be, be, it's because he was in the video, but no, that was by me asking him what he thought of it. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> And then yep. um, the last one I want to ask you about, um, this was a couple of years later. It's the uh, Latoya Luckett song, Torn. Yeah. Yeah, yes. talk, talk to me about that song. Um, Torn was uh, produced by myself and written by, by a guy named uh, also Dave Young. Um, and um, that song just kind of came about where um, Latoya had called me and asked me to put, you know, put together some tracks for her. So I went in the studio and then coming up with different tracks and I had an idea of her doing something a little bit more older so I, so I kind of dug in my crates and put up an old stylistic record now my, Mary J. Blige had already did that particular sample previously yeah. so I just did some different things so I flipped it and played live music 
music and live piano across it and gave it a different feel. So when she heard it, she loved it. She went crazy over it. And um, I flew out to L.A. and we cut up the song on her. And um, just like anything else, you know, we put the song together vocally. I, you know, got in the studio, got her vocals, mixed in. You know, at the time when you're cutting records, you don't know what's going to happen, but the song turned out to be a number one smash. Yeah, definitely. That's one of my favorites. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, now, um, I wanted to ask you, because, you know, the radio isn't really playing a lot of R&B right now. You know, it's very dance-driven, and I know that's affected that, a lot of um, R&B artists. You know, does that affect you as a producer? I'll be honest and, I'll be honest and, and say that it has, but I've diversified. And you have to diversify yourself as a producer, and it's funny that you say dance, because that's what I'm producing now. I'm producing more dance-driven club. Uh, music, uh, R and B has taken a backseat, unfortunately, and I think I think one of the reasons is because R and B, on some levels, is not putting out great music anymore. Yeah. So, so, so a lot of people, and then you know, um, the world has become globally. So, music is a global thing now. So you have to really, you know, R and B to me really has to go through a uh, a transition mode, so to speak. It has to evolve into something else. And, um, but yes, in answer to your question, it has affected me to a degree and a lot of other R&B producers, but you have to diversify and do other things. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, you know, we Absolutely. haven't, we haven't really heard too much from you recently, so, you know, kind of bring us up to date with what you're working on currently. Well, because I've been in the business over 20 years, you know, my goal was always not to just produce music, but to get into TV and film and film scoring. Okay. So over the, over, over the past uh, six years, I've been involved in a lot of independent film scoring. I'm still producing songs. I'm, you know, I'm still working on independent artists. I have an artist that I'm working on. She's a, she's a uh, dance artist. Um, we're producing her album right now. Um, we have some labels invested, you know, some, some interest in her. Um, but as far as me as a producer, I'm more or less now diversifying myself because of the effect of the music industry, because of the digital age. Um, I'm doing more movie scores alongside with producing records at the same time. So that's where I'm at in my career at this particular time. Okay, definitely. Um, are you able to kind of talk about who you're currently working with right now? Yes, well, as far as, as far, you mean as far as like musical artists, like things of that nature? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm working with a kid right now named, his name is Prince Royce. Okay. He's, a, he's an independent act, but Atlantic has just signed him, so I'm actually working on some songs for him right now. I'm working on, um, like I said, I'm, I'm doing a lot of independent work. There's a girl overseas that I'm working with from a, from a record label called JYP. It's an Asian group over there that I'm working with. Um, and I, a lot of times I like to keep their stuff kind of like, they're really picky about what you, you know, talking about their stuff at this moment. So I kind of like to keep that under wraps. But I just, you know, you can word it, where, you know, just where I'm just, I'm working on a lot of overseas stuff at the moment. Okay. Um, um, Prince Roy, uh, I've been called to put some, um, uh, work on some stuff for um, Lloyd, the artist named Lloyd. Are you familiar with Lloyd? Yep, definitely. Yeah, yep. So, you know, um, I've been called to act to put some, put some wrecks together for these particular groups or acts. But, um, like I said, a lot of the stuff that I've been doing over the last maybe year has been a lot more focused towards the TV and film side. Okay, that's what's up, man. And, um, yeah. you know, unfortunately this weekend, you know, we saw the passing of Whitney Houston, and I know you worked with her on a couple of songs, so just kind of talk Absolutely. to me about, you know, what you remember about working with her. And I'm glad you brought that up because if you didn't, I was, um, because I've been, I've been asked for, by a lot of people to be interviewed about her. I worked with Whitney Houston back in 2006. Yeah. But I had, but I had worked with her prior because once again, if you go back to my history, I was with LaFace Records. So I was around her at the time when she was working on the Bodyguard album and things of that nature. Okay. But she, she called on my specific services around in 2006 and, um, she flew me out to her home and, I stayed with her for probably about a week or so, and man, it was the most, you know, it was, it was a great experience because I always wanted to work with Whitney Houston. Um, was she going through some of her problems at that time? Yes, she was, but, you know, she still was very, very sweet. She still was a very, very upstanding person. Um, 
her, her, she was just a very good person, man. It, it, very, it really saddened me to see that she passed away over this weekend. Uh, you know, I have pictures with her and everything, man. And I, I knew her really well, man. She she called me the bishop. That's what she called me. Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, you know, you know, because my last name is Bishop. She called me the bishop. You know, she always kind of teased me about you know being a pastor or whatever. But she was a very very sweet woman, and I would like to uphold her legacy by just saying that you know we really really lost a really big icon in this music industry. She was one of the truest, great uh, performers of all times, if you ask me. Yeah, definitely, man. Uh, thank definitely. You, you know, I appreciate you for sharing that with us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely.